So welcome everybody to today's flow session. Uh, delighted to have you all here. My name is Helen Beale. I am the CEO and chair at the Valley Stream Management Consortium. And I'm super excited to have two of our megastar ambassadors with us today, the authors of Valley Stream Reference Architectures, Stephen and Craig. So uh, let's stop some intros. Craig, do you want to kick us off? Oh yeah, hey, hey Helen, hey, everybody. Good to see everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Craig Statham. I'm the chief uh, software architect at uh, SAS Institute. Um, I've been a been a senior manager for for many years. Um, recently transitioned a few couple of years ago into a role of of architect, and uh, you'll hear all today about uh, about the journey that I've uh, had with uh, with Stephen and our delivery of the value stream reference architecture and kind of what it's meant to SAS as well. So awesome, Stephen. Tell us all about you. Yes, hello, hello everybody. Um, yes, Stephen Walters, a field CTO at uh, GitLab for the EMEA region and also help around everywhere else around the globe where I can. Um, been into DevOps now for far too long. Um, it's just showing a little bit maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, my passion is value stream management. This is what I really love talking about and researching and working in. Uh, I think I've dealt with just about every framework that's ever existed beforehand, but value stream management feels to me as though we're finally getting somewhere close to where we need to be. That's so well put. There's a really passionate community of us around BSM and the BSMC, and I'm the same. It's like it's almost become not religious, but it's like it's a bit like I'm a believer. It's like I've been through all of those paths over the last 30 years as well, and it's like suddenly everything feels like it's starting to click into into place and I've had the pleasure of meeting so many people because of my connection to BSM including you two but why don't you tell us a bit more about how you two met uh, who wants to go first Craig you can go first uh, yeah so it was it was February I think February of 2022 when Stephen and I first got chatting um, it was as I mentioned earlier it was just during this period where I was transitioning into this role of being architect and um, when when you take somebody who's been a manager for most of their career, nearly entirely my career, uh, and put them in the role of architect, that person is going to be way more interested in the team organization and how the teams work together and how that affects the software architecture than the actual technology and architecture itself. And that's where I found myself. And what, um, what I was struggling with at the time was um, trying to understand how our organization structure was kind of impacting our ability to deliver software. Um, and I picked up a, 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 this book, right, Team Topologies by Matthew Scott. This was 2019 when this came out. Um, and I looked at that and I, I saw Stephen talking on a, a conference. I think it was a Redmond conference, Stephen, when you were appearing, talking about value stream management. And I was I thinking, these, these two things must be able to help me, but I couldn't figure out how. And so I reached out to Stephen, not really expecting him to respond to me because he was a busy guy and I, you know, I knew he was appearing at lots of different conferences. But he did, and we started chatting. And maybe Stephen, you want to explain what happened next? Yeah, I mean, at, at, at that time, I, you know, twenty twenty two value stream management still very much in its infancy in regards to the IT industry, and we were all trying to find a feat as to how value stream management could be used practically within the industry. And th this is what we were feeling for. We were all talking about the theory. We were all talking about how we believed it should work but how it would actually work within organizations. We were spouting a lot of thoughts and ideas, but not a lot of practical use or practical understanding. I think it's fair to say that in the time since, even since then, over the two years, we, you know, with implementing books like Team Topologies, but also your books like Flow Engineering are helping to actually develop our ideas and our thoughts and, and the way that we're going. And, but what I was missing was that practical capability because the companies that I work for, I'm working for software companies that are supplying to customers. And customers are wondering, how do I do this? What, what do I have to do to do it? But not many were prepared to get engaged in a practical discussion about their own organization and their own woes and actually to challenge me on, um, on the theories you know, how how do these theories come into practice? And that's where it was really refreshing to bump into Craig, you know, Craig who wanted to say, right, 
I'm going to tell you, how do you do this? How do you really, really do this? And it, it brought on something that both he and I really enjoy, which was a lot of debate and discussion, um, which started off just on a monthly basis and then to every two weeks. And I think now we're talking every week at least, and we're on WhatsApp channels and uh, chatting with each other. But it's just something that organically grew out of that. We, we would, you know, take it to how do we deal with this? How do we deal with that? And then we started putting theories together. And I think, uh, Craig, it was you who were the first one. Was, you There, there was a, uh, another conference that you'd gone to that you, you'd heard someone speak on graph theory? Yeah, there, there was, yes. Um, Nikki Watts um, had appeared at a, a conference that I saw. Again, another online conference. I remember, you have to remember, this was we were coming out of the pandemic in 2022, right? And so lots of people were still online with conferences, which was great because they were all free. It was amazing. You could go to lots of online conferences and learn. And, um, and Nikki Watts and some other researchers were using graph theory um, to reason about their software architecture, particularly microservice architectures, to understand whether or not the architecture was tending towards being a distributed monolith. And Stephen and I had been chatting about Conway's law and talking about how Conway's law relates to, to the, the organization and the, and the software architecture. And, and I suddenly kind of thought, well, if there's a connection between architecture and organization in this way, then maybe graph theory is something we can also look at to reason about our organization. So, so that's what we started to started to do. And we, we had a, a few conversations backwards and forwards about, about that, I remember, Stephen. And um, I think there was a, a, a moment, a ha-ha moment, maybe you want to kind of talk about a little bit that we that we had in that. Well, the, the, there was a few aha moments, but I think it's the first one you're talking about when we started to think about graph theory and we sort of thought, right, let's apply team put topologies in here. Let's have a look at these team topology types, which are up on the board, you'll see behind me. And actually, it's quite coincidental. I just drew that for somebody else. That was a, a completely different discussion. But you can see on there, and it's in the paper, this relationship that we suddenly realized that existed within team topologies. If you look at the generalized flow of data, the generalized flow of information between teams, and where there's dependencies between teams, then there was a very distinct pattern. So the, the streamlined team always receives uh, information and support from the other team types. You know, as, as, as Ma uh, Matthew and Manuel say within their book, streamlined team is the be all and end all. All of the other teams are there to support the flow within that team. So they provide, they are providers of value into the streamlined team to enable them to actually deliver. So you can see on the top of that pyramid, that all of the pointers in this directional graph are pointing out to the other teams. But likewise, enabling teams typically don't receive uh, any data from other team types. They are providing support, they're enablers for all of the other team types, your complicated subsystems, your platform groups, and your streamlined teams. And this aha moment came when uh, this was put down into a graph and we looked at the direction of the flow and suddenly realized there's a unique pattern here. There's, there's something here that we can actually use and start to reason about. Because this was one of the key things that, that, that had come up in our discussions um, was how do you identify a value stream? It's a problem that I've seen when you go into value stream mapping sessions and you talk with customers, you know, and it's there on the value stream management implementation roadmap. Before you get into mapping, you need to identify your value streams. Well, you go into a customer and you say, right, which value stream are we going to map? And the first question is either, one, what is a value stream? Or two, okay, how do I identify those value streams then once I know what they are? And it was pretty much guesswork. Most customers, they would select a product or they would decide something that they want or they think is a value stream. And more often than not, you would go in there and your value stream really needs to be based around a streamlined team that's delivering that value. But more often than not, you'd end up finding yourself, I'm working with a platform group here. This is a platform team that's supplying something internally to another team. Is it really a value stream? Well, yes, it's a value stream, but it's not helping them in terms of their value delivery to their end user, the customer. 
So that that capability to identify what your value streams are was extremely important, really, because you cut all the rest of the stuff, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't identify your value streams correctly, everything else you're going to do later around the mapping and around the connectivity and around your metrics and your measurements is all going to be for, for nothing. And... Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm waffling a little bit. Craig, I'll hand over to you in a minute. I'm but, still following what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly as well. But there, there was a really great question that uh, Christian asked us. And it, when you go onto the website, we've got a brief intro, intro before you can, as you go to download. Christian uh, asked us a um, question. How does identifying your team topology types help you with your system design, your architecture and value stream management? And it comes down to this. How can you identify a value stream if you don't know the identities of your teams that form that value stream? Yeah. They have to have a clear identity and an understanding of what they were. And I'm going to hand over to Craig here because that's something that he realized very much within his organization early on. Craig. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, and that was the thing. So, I was getting into this whole idea of how do we use value streams. What I was noticing and what Stephen and I were talking about is that these streams don't, the, te the teams and the streams don't exist in these nicely ordered sequential group of teams, right? We think about work being passed off from one team to the next, and we think about going kind of from start to finish, but the teams really don't exist like that. In real organizations, they're, they're connected in much more complicated ways and sometimes complex ways that makes them very unpredictable in terms of how you actually get value out of that team network and organization and that's something we were we were definitely struggling with at the time I, I remember I've said to people a, a lot if I if if I had a dollar for every time I heard one of the product managers ask the question so which teams do we need to get involved to make this feature happen I'd be rich by now because that was the question that came every every time, and a lot of and sometimes we'd go, oh yeah, we know the answer to that. But a lot of the times we we kind of throw our hands in the air and go, well, we don't know. We'll get back to you. Like, give us some time. We'll have to go figure that out, right? And it was just slow and it was kind of painful and it was you know all the complex planning that that kind of had to happen. So so when Stephen and I were, were then looking at how to apply graph theory to to team topologies. Um, and looking at those relationships between the teams in, in terms of being able to identify teams, we started playing with um, graph centralities, which is an area of graph theory um, that allows you to reason about the different nodes of your graph and how they and how they correspond to each other. And one of the things we were recognizing is that teams that are important to a group or an organization tend to be towards the, the, the centralities in the, in the graph where they have a high what we call page rank. Um, and page rank, if you if you've heard of that before, um, it's the it's the graph centrality that drives the internet. If you go to Google and you do a Google search, right, the order of things that you see in your Google search is driven by page rank, and it's actually one of the simplest pieces of uh, graph technology to implement. It's ten lines of code. It's the most valuable piece of code in the in the universe. I think ten lines of code to to compute page rank. But what we recognized was that between the team topologies, some teams, some team types were more centralized and more important than others. That would also mean there's a, and there's a, here's where there's a, where there's a rub, right? You think, okay, they're central. They're going to be able to amplify value and create lots of value for the organization because we have these centralized teams. And that can be true, but more often than not, they become bottlenecks and they become the sticking points in your organization because they're so valuable to you. And, and everybody wants to use that part of the organization to do something. And so those teams become overloaded when they're so central to the organization in that way, they're, they're, they just struggle to serve everybody. Um, and that's what we were finding. We had some teams that were very much like that and they'd be involved in every single piece of work that ever happened to deliver some, some feature or function to the organization. Um, the other graph centrality we, we kind of looked at was betweenness um, centrality. And that, and that is a, uh, a centrality that helps you to understand how much a team or a node in the graph is on the path to other nodes. So how does it, how does it connect one node to another? So if you have three nodes um, connected where there's a node in the middle and the, the node at either ends can't talk to each other except through the middle node, then the middle node will have high betweenness. And what we found was that, again, in team topologies, there were some of the team types that would have a tendency towards a higher value of betweenness 
um, than others. Um, and that's where we were able then to, to come up with the idea of, of team type classification and creating a, a, a mechanism for identifying the different team types that existed in your organization simply by looking at the graph of your organization in terms of how the teams were connected, applying, applying the technique, and then it's spitting out, here are your probable team types. Uh, and that really, and Stephen, that kind of then really helped us like with kind of the, the next aha moment in terms of understanding interaction. So I'll let you, I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, because, uh, and it's something that I, I've had discussions with both Ma Matthew and Manuel about, and it, I, I mention it a lot. When people talk about team topologies, they naturally focus on the team types, on the 14 types, streamlined, enabling, platform, and complicated uh, subsystem. And that tends to be the only focus. I, I remember one talk I went to, that's all they spoke about. They didn't mention anything about the team interactions. And based upon, you know, with what um, Craig was just saying, those interactions, how those nodes interoperate with each other is key to the flow. Without those interactions, there is no flow. Everything just stays within one team. And that's just not going to happen. You know, no team is an island. Every organization is made up of teams that need to work with each other. Now, this is where there's a, a popular myth within DevOps. You hear the term, right? Everybody must collaborate. Let's all collaborate. But the problem is that collaboration is only one type of interaction. Uh, the other interaction types defined within team topologies, them being um, facilitating and as a service, are a different type of interaction and probably just as important. Because the problem is that if everybody's collaborating, as uh, they say within the, the within the book, then you are sharing that workload. It provides innovation, but it slows down flow because now you as a team, if I'm uh, working with somebody else in another team, I am now having to think about what he's doing in that team and he's having to think about what I'm doing in that team. And we are having to work together across teams to get this right. Now, what usually happens as per Conway's law this means that we end up creating an integration or within the architecture, we end up create, creating something that's tightly coupled because we are now talking almost as a team. So as a team, we create this integration, which then massively couples these two things together. And this is where you then end up with, as we've seen within many organizations, where they've broken down a monolith into 40 microservices. And they, so their, their time for delivery has gone down from a year and a half to uh, three weeks. Great, that's what they want. But then slowly over time, that time for delivery starts expanding out and they're wondering why. And it's because they've been doing this collaboration and slowly linking all of these things. And before you know it, you've got 40 microservices that are operating as a monolith. You have a monolith of microservices. And there's a great expression that Craig used, it's just a great big ball of mud. Because every team, you don't have a team topology, they're all operating the same, and they're all talking to each other the same way, and they're all supposed to operate in the same way. But that's not true. Every team has needs to have clear responsibilities, needs to have clear communications. They need to have a clear understanding and responsibility for what their role is in the overall delivery of value within a value stream. And that's the problem, is that we've tried to make all of them, you know, very, I, don't, I can't think of what the word is now, but they're all very vanilla. They're all exactly the same. And going back to your ice cream analogy, that team's mint chocolate chip, they're <laughs> rum and raisin. You know, they all have something different that they are contributing to as part of the organization. It's so definitely... we need to look at those interaction types. Just want to and say, we... we have got a question from the audience, and I also want to ask you a question, but Craig, I think you wanted to follow on for a minute. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add to what Steve was, I was going to point out, we've got a great question that we, could, that we I think we can answer here as well, but just to kind of add on to what Steve was saying there, and I think the word you were looking for was equal, was uh, equality or, or, or treating, treating, treating teams equitably, um, which is what a lot of organisations kind of fall into this trap of like not really thinking about their teams as being any different. All the teams are just the same and they're all given the same equal opportunity to deliver value and to, and to collaborate. And we think that's great, right? And for some things, maybe that works. But for a lot of teams, it doesn't because as Stephen said, that we're not really thinking about those interactions in terms of what that really means to deliver value and how those teams should interact with each other and should talk to each other. 
Um, but I, Helen, do you want to read the question that we've got from uh, Valadis? I think that's a, a brilliant question. Yeah, I certainly can. So the question is, is the value stream something we design or we discover? And then there's a little bit of follow up as well. We would always see a single stream aligned team correspond, or would we always see a single stream aligned team correspond to a customer value stream? In my experience, value streams can be huge. So you can have more than one stream aligned team for reaching a customer outcome. So we did, do we design smaller streams by breaking down the customer needs? Yes. I was going to say that this this was something that we did touch on briefly, and we sort of backed away from this a little bit. Was concept of value streams within value streams. So you can have a, uh, for example, a business service, and you look in there towards you know things like Spotify models and things like that, where they define these large teams of one hundred to one hundred and fifty people, which in turn get broken down into your product tribes, which are also a value stream that deliver a product for that business service. But that, for that, that ran us into some issues around how these streamlined teams actually interact with each other and how they operate with each other. So we backed away from that slightly. What's really interesting, though, is that first part of the question. Is it something we design or something we discover? Mm -hmm. And I would say the answer is actually both. Because the thing is, within, within depends upon what your organization is using as its leader. Uh, as its lead thing into what it's building. If you define the architecture up front, then typically your teams then get set up around that architecture. And therefore, then you start to discover what your value streams are within there. Yeah, I know it slightly differently as well, though. I don't know how much you agree with this. So I believe that every organisation is made up of value streams whether people have seen them or call them that, every organisation that has customers or in case of government has citizens, which are the, their equivalent customers, they have value streams. So in that respect, they're just waiting to be seen or waiting to be discovered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and But there's also an element of design about it because that's what we did with the value stream reference architecture was to give you that capability to actually design what your right. value streams are going so to let's be. Let's pause. I know that people are really fascinated by everything you're talking about. John said outstanding discussion. Um, John said it's exciting to hear the evolution. He's finished the data science program in 2019, experimenting graph and centrality metrics on their technology portfolio. And he knew there's a great possibility there, but he hasn't been able to get back to it. So let's just reflect for a moment. You've talked about these great conversations and discoveries that you were making together as you built your, your relationship and your friendship and, and your, uh, your work together. But at what point did you think, we should build a reference architecture, we should write this down together? <laughs> what happened? That's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it was as we were as we were evolving these ideas and we started to put them into, into practice in my own organization and started to see um, some outcomes from that, what we, what we were recognizing was this is something we should share, right? This is, this is no longer just a conversation between me and Stephen and Stephen kind of helping me out to figure all this stuff out, right? This is something, this is something that other people kind of really need to know about. So that's when we kind of went, went ahead and started working on the, um, the, the first iteration of the, of the paper that we created to try and put down our ideas. Um, what we recognized, though, um, over the last year or so is that whilst the, the techniques of the, um, the application of the, of the theory into what we're doing are, are, are really useful for, for a lot of people, it, it's, it's, it's stuff that, um, I know it's hard for them to kind of wrap their head around um, uh, and we wanted to try and find a way where we can make that easier um, and I think that's what we've tried to do with with the, the newer yeah. version of the paper and and uh, make so it more a little bit of the genesis and let's just be a bit kind of add some clarity around that if you don't mind so the the, the version one of the reference architecture came out what 18 months ago and we published it through DevOps Institute and um, you guys have done a revision which we may as well call version two and we've just launched that today on the value stream management consulting website I put the link in earlier but I'll add it again in a minute so that version two is what you're just talking about so just summarize again Craig what's the difference between those versions what's the learnings 
Yeah, so what, what, we, what we did is we, we've, we've put it much more into um, business terms this time around um, to help people to kind of understand how the application actually provides real, uh, real value into their own organisations. And we've, we've stripped a lot of the maths out. We recognised that a lot of the maths that we put in there was maybe stuff that people just had a hard time um, digesting. I wasn't necessary to actually get value out of using out of using the VSRA techniques. Um, so we've really we've really kind of focused it more towards trying to help people understand how they get value out of um, the uh, the what we did. I, I actually kind of think of ourselves as uh, as, as really being an enabling team. Right. We're trying to take on some more of that cognitive load so that others don't have to kind of think about that and facilitate this technique that will allow them to reason about their organization, discover their value streams in their organization, which is the, going back to the question we just had. Right. Is it discovery or is it design? But once you've discovered what your organization really looks like and you can see that, then it gives you the opportunity to then think about, well, how should it be designed? can we go and start modifying our organization and modifying our software architecture because those two things have to be congruent in order that we can accelerate and increase the, the rate with which we can deliver value to our end users. John in the audience has just asked if we're going to be at the Enterprise Technology Leadership Summit, what was does in Las Vegas um, this month, it's now August, obviously today. Um, I'm not going to be, are either of you two planning going to be there, planning to be there this year? Um, yeah, we were there last year for uh, 2023, and uh, you can actually view that video from the IT Revolution website, but you do need to have an IT Revolution account to yeah. see that video. It's free, though, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, we won't be at uh, ETLS this year, but um, we will be at Flowtopia, which uh, in London, which is on the 9th of October, if I remember rightly. So, and I then uh, we'll also be at Fast Flow Conf. We won't be speaking, but we will be there and available at Fast Flow Conf on the 10th yeah. of October as yeah. well. So I've just put the link in the chat to Flotopia London, um, which is a, an evening, as we call it, our roadshow events. So um, we've done them a couple of times before around these bigger events. Uh, but in other exciting news, we are currently in the process of launching the big Flowtopia event, our flagship event that if any of you've been to the last couple of years um, has been in person in Las Vegas. But this year we're actually doing things a little bit differently. We're taking Flowtopia online. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be really big. It's going to be 12 hours long. It's going to be 60 talks. Um, everything's going to be recorded, obviously, so you can dive in, see it live whenever you want, or you can see it on demand later. And um, we'll probably make the on demand ultimately available to our amazing members that help fund everything that we do, because we are a not-for-profit, remember, funded by our membership fees. But I put a couple of links in the chat for you. Um, we'd love to see you at Flotopia London. And if you are interested in speaking at Flotopia, you'll find the call for speakers link in that page I've just put in the chat. And... Um, if you're interested in sponsoring, which would be a huge help to make sure that we can pay for the team and the platform that we are going to be using to get this event going, that would also be amazing as well. So that was a little advertorial break. Thank you, John, for triggering that for us. Um, we've had a lot of chat about Conway's Law. Um, did we mention with the reverse Conway's manoeuvre? Have we gone into that yet? Uh, no, not 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 really. I, I mean, th th this was some. This is something that's obviously discussed a lot within uh, team topologies, um, yeah. and we wanted to basically build off the back of that. We mentioned about how we've done this graph theory, which allows you to identify your team topology types. It also allows you to identify your interactions, and from that you can draw a graph. And from that, identify what your potential value stream flow is, what your your key paths are. But then we saw the value in potentially then taking that graph and saying, well, hang on a minute, is this the actual architecture that we want in our organization? Is this the correct architecture for the system? And is it the correct organization? Because of the, we, what we need with Conway's Law is we need harmony between the organization and the architecture. So it's very much about using what we've found with the graph theory to say, okay, if this is going to be reflective of both our organization and our architecture to keep them in uh, commonality, let's use that to help us design our system. So let's design our architecture 
and then design our organization to support that architecture. But then the key thing came when we realized, well, hang on a minute, if system design is changing because it's going to incrementally change, then our organization needs to incrementally change as well. So now what we've got is we've got a method or a pattern of actually mapping out what our value stream network is looking like, what our value stream network looks like, but also how it gets impacted by change. And as a result, how our organization gets impacted by that change as well. So we can incrementally change our organization over time rather than um, something that uh, I've got I've got a white paper coming out with Lee Faust from GitLab as well uh, soon, where we talk about architectural drift, which is where you've got um, your organization and your architecture and slowly changes are made to your architecture and it drifts away from that organization. And then after a long period of time, it means massive reorganizations, which are costly, time wasting, remove value. And you can lose a lot of intellectual property and valuable people from your organization or a massive re-architecture exercise, which same thing again, extremely costly, takes time away from value delivery for your customers. Yeah. So that that is what we saw as the importance of plugging in the inverse Conway maneuver into there, because now you've got a method of drawing that map, doing that design, coming back to the design or discovery question. And then from that, designing the the architecture and the organisation that you want. And I think that I think that is re really really important because uh, that there aren't many organisations that find themselves in in the unique opportunity of building an entire brand new team from scratch, right, or new organisation from scratch. That doesn't happen very often. Most organisations use the existing team organisation and team structures that they have to build new product. And they try to overlay that new product in the existing in the existing architecture, software architecture, and, and team organization. Uh, and invariably, there's there's a misalignment, right? There's the two things don't don't kind of go together. Um, and that's where organizations start looking at using the reverse way maneuver to now change their organization in order to have effect on their software architecture to get it the way they want it to be. But as Stephen said, organizational change can be highly costly. And if you get it wrong and you make the wrong choice about your organization, that can be hugely costly because you find yourself doing redos of the whole thing over and over and over again. In fact, you get stuck in this cycle of not actually being able to move forward because you're constantly kind of having to change your organization to try and find the right, the right organization structure and the right software architecture. Um, and I think, Helen, a, a few weeks ago, you had Pavel on the, on the Flow Sessions show talking about digital twins. Um, and I think in some regards, that's what we've done with VSRA. VSRA gives you the opportunity to really create a simulation of your organization because using the, the technique and using the, the analysis that, that, that gives you with graph theory, you can, you can kind of ask questions. What about if we change the organization so we created a new team? We had a new team to this network and, and dropped it in over here and connected it to these other teams. What about if we if we change the way these other teams were connected? Perhaps we, we don't allow them to kind of collaborate quite so much. Perhaps we have to have them collaborate with other teams. So we change the network in that way. Perhaps we remove some teams entirely. What does that what does that do to our organization? And by throwing that into the VSRA tools, you can then start to look at that and reason about what effect it's going to have on flow because we give you some some values for for flow out of the out of the analysis that happens and then you've really got these digital twins that you're creating where you can do that without actually changing a single thing in your real organization until you feel good about a new org structure that you can then affect and actually then move forward with and i think when you do that your chance of success is way greater that it is when you just randomly kind of make org change was that really kind of reasoning or thinking about how those teams are going to interact and have to work with each other. So I think that's one of the one of the key things that's coming out of VSRA is this ability to experiment without actually moving a single person in your org. We've got some great feedback coming in from the audience as well. I forgot actually Fortune said quite a long time ago um, about liberating structures and other um, methods like um, organization mapping, stakeholder mapping, customer mapping, I assume that's customer journey mapping as well. Eco cycle, which is a new one on me, I like that. And then another new one on me just came through from Declan, which was about dynamic teaming. Um, actually a question, I, I'm not familiar with dynamic teaming, is that something you guys have looked at? 
A little, a little, a little bit, yes. Um, and actually, it is, it is. Some of this is covered not with those terms, but covered in the in the book on teaming topologies. Um, and dynamic teaming, it's a that's another double-edged sword, right? It can it can be really, really useful, but it can also have some downsides as well. What dynamic teaming is is the is the ability to um, really just change your teams and move people around at, at kind of will, right? Take people out of teams and move them to other teams and get them to do some really good work over over there, and and that sometimes can have a, a great effect because you can get things done quickly. But the downsides of dynamic teaming as well is is the extent to which cognitive load is now placed on those individuals that are moving out of one team into another because context switching is a huge factor in cognitive load. Um, also, the, the, the problems there exist, of course, is that it's all about information sharing, right? When, you, when people are doing work, doing knowledge work, um, Stephen referred to these interactions earlier as data and information. That's really what's going on in terms of how our teams are kind of connecting and working with each other. So when you move somebody dynamically to another team, they're taking some information and knowledge with them that later on is actually going to be pulled out again. So what happens to the group that's left behind? How do they now manage that that information is no longer really available to them? Probably what they end up doing is now going back to that person and, and talking to that person who's moved now somewhere else. Now that person's getting overloaded because now they're, they're having multiple things to kind of deal with and multiple requests. And so maybe then they've got too much work in, process, in progress, another killer of productivity. So there are upsides and downsides to dynamic teaming. Um, I, I personally think that once you understand your, your value streams that you've got in your organization and you understand your value stream reference architecture and how interactions are happening is that the, the majority of the time that you get the best results is to kind of stick with that, right? Until you need to change it because you're changing your product or changing your needs or changing something else. Um, but all of these techniques are, I mean, they're wonderful things to kind of research and, and look into. And I, I, I really get excited. You can tell I get excited about all of this stuff. There's so many productivity killers, aren't there? And it's like the UK in particular, not, not very famous for our productivity levels at the moment. But I think this is kind of the fundamental, what we're trying to do with value streams, isn't it? Is understand that flow. And you've held up Steve's book, Flow Engineering. But should we talk about that a little bit more about what we're learning from Steve in that book and what we're learning about flow entropy? And I think you have this concept of resilience numbers as well. Do you want to introduce the audience to that? Yeah, it was uh, something I like to call the butterfly net moment. Um, we, 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 we just had this moment where we suddenly realised okay we're, we're dealing with data we're dealing with information it's in bits it's you know it's the stuff that actually flows now we didn't know it at the time until much later on in the relationship but both of us come from a background of electrical and electronic engineering so we both got also got this concept of flow in terms of the flow of electrons within a wire which isn't really flow but it's this concept of the fact that you've got this current, this amperage, you've also got um, that that in terms of a flow because you've got a potential difference between two areas, the voltage, there's a potential difference in there, and then you've got resistance in there. And in order for all of that to, to happen, you've got to apply power. You've got to have power in there. You've got to apply effort and energy. And we started to see parallels because we were thinking, right, we because what all of this was about was about taking the subjectivity out of it and making an objective way in which we can des design our value streams, our architecture, and measure and manage our flow through our value stream network. So thinking in a scientific way, we, we have started to apply Newtonian thinking into this, you know, about you know, if we apply a force in there, you know, and there's resistance and so on. And we started to see parallels in there. So we saw the flow of work um, actually, Craig, do you want to take take it from here? So, uh, flow of work, current, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, were, there was there was absolutely, as Stephen said, absolutely parallels that we were seeing with our experience from electrical electronic engineering, and and that um, flow is something that is a function of time, right? And so when you when you do work and work is or information is passing from one team to another, it takes some time for that to happen, right? Which is what flow is. It's the passage of things moving, but it doesn't happen unless there's unless there's time to do that. Um, 
But in order for flow to happen, something has to be pushing that flow, right? There has to be something that's requiring that flow to happen. And, and in information systems and knowledge systems and software teams, that's really our requirements. It's the requirements, it's the needs that we have. So things that we want to achieve, they're the pulling force that make flow, flow happen. Um, and it was that pulling force that we kind of recognized is similar to voltage in, in, in the electrical world. It's what makes the flow, it's what makes the flow happen. Um, at the same time, of course, there are things that push against that flow, right? We all, we all know this when we're working in software teams is that often you start working on a project, start something going, and then all of a sudden there's a blocker, right? And, and of course, we have stand-up meetings every day if we're doing Agile and we're doing Scrum or all those, all those kind of techniques where the main point of those meeting, meetings is to, is to identify what the blockers are so that we can remove them because those blockers are impeding the flow. They're stopping the flow of work from happening. And so again, what we recognized is that this impedance or this blocking of flow is like resistance um, in electrical circuits. Um, and then as Stephen said as well, that you know, teams need energy to do stuff, right? They, they it takes effort, it takes power. Um, and so we talk about that in terms of the effort that's required um, is, is sort of similar to cognitive load, right? It's what's going on in our minds in order for us to, in order for us to get stuff done. We're literally burning energy in our brains when we're doing knowledge work. Um, and so we looked at the relationship of, of those four dimensions, flow, um, impe impediments, needs, uh, and um, en energy or effort, and recognized that Ohm's law, which is the, the law in electrical circuits that, that controls how flow happens with electrons through wires, um, was absolutely the same, the same, the same thing. Um, and so we, we started then to reason about some equations that we could create um, using Ohm's law to really understand how flow was happening in our organizational networks. And that brought us back to the graph theory again, um, because we'd recognized that this value of page rank that we were seeing in the graph theory um, was actually an indicator of impedance. Because again, if a team is important, and they become a bottleneck to your organization because they're so important, then they're gonna slow flow down because ultimately they're going, to, they're going to have lots of work being thrown at them and they're just not going to be able to do all of it. And as, as much as we'd like to see those teams as being amplifiers of value, invariably what actually happens is they become bottlenecks. Um, so we took the idea of using the, the page rank value as our value for, for in, in, impedance. Um, and then the other thing we did was we needed to look at, well, how, we, how do we get those other values? And we recognized that the interactions that were happening between teams were the point with which the, was where the effort was actually really being expended because the effort of making work go from one team to the other is where that, that kind of energy is kind of being used in order to make flow, flow happen. Um, and so then we started to think about, well, how do we, how do we reason about that amount of effort that's required? And, and that, brought us back to team topologies and the interaction styles that were in team topologies. Um, and there's this three interaction styles, collaboration as a service and facilitation. Um, and, and we started to think about, well, how does, how does that work in terms of the amount of effort that somebody's using when they're using those interaction styles, which was another ha-ha moment, which I'll let you kind of explain that we got into, Stephen. Yeah, so th th this is where we came up with this concept of a cognitive slope. Which is basically that you've, if you think of a right angle triangle within there, and you've got that hypotenuse, that angle, at the very top, you've got a value hive. So this is a single teamed organization, produces all the value, doesn't work with anybody else, and actually probably doesn't exist unless you're a one team company. Um, at the other end of the scale, down at the bottom, you've got a, a, a value void. You've got this thing, this null pointer, this null team that doesn't produce any value whatsoever. And if you've got one of them in your organization, then you need to get onto HR. If, if that exists, you're in big trouble. But along this slope, along this cognitive slope, is the, the various interaction styles. So if you think of that, that right angle triangle now flipping that, so you've got two sides where one side is the provider and one side is the receiver of value, then when you're in a collaborative style, it's very 50-50. You know, each team takes on half of the cognitive load. But if you're operating as a service, then 
it's the provider that is pr uh, providing the vast majority of that cognitive load. They're the ones putting the effort in to create the service, provide the service, and make it available to you as the receiver. So you as the receiver have got a small amount of cognitive load in terms of taking that service on and making use of it. At the other end of the scale, you've got facilitation. And as a facilitator, I've got all of my materials, I've got all of my learnings, all my assets there available to pass to another team. So the receiver is the one that's got the vast majority of cognitive load because they've got to take all of those learnings and absorb it and apply it into their everyday workings, whether that's a new way of working, whether it's a new technology, whether it's a new tool, whatever that is, the burden is actually upon them. So we recognize this slope that depending upon the interaction type and whether you're a provider or a receiver of that, that load, that impacts the amount of cognitive effort that you are putting into a particular role and what you're doing in, in that role. Yep. So that's where we applied that then. into. So we were now in a situation where, well, we've got the impedance and we've got the effort. And we know from Ohm's law that if we know any two, we can calculate any one of the other two. And this is where we came up with the fine flow equations, which are basically taking Ohm's law and applying it in this situation, allowing you to now calculate what your flow is, what your impedance is, what your needs and what your effort is. By the way, no units involved. These are just values to see uh, as a comparison between teams as to how they're actually performing, who's got the greatest effort, who's got the, who's creating the greatest flow of value. And we find that within particular team types, there's particular values that we see. So streamlined teams have the highest value uh, of, you know, flow, the uh, highest value for flow. Um, your platform teams typically have the highest amount of effort. They're the ones providing the most effort because they're operating as a service. They're constantly having to work to maintain that service to allow streamlined teams to deliver. And something we did, and this comes back to your original question, we then, right, look, we've got to model this. We've got to see if this insane thought of ours is really a butterfly net moment, if it really works. So we actually modeled it out based upon a scenario where, you know, there's a certain number of impediments coming in, you know, because incidents always happen, you know, with for every release that goes out, you get good flow, which you hope is going to be 100%, never is. There's always some incidents. There's something that goes out of date. There's brand new needs that come in or there's problems that, that, that occur within production. Those come back into your system as impediments, as defects, as issues that you need to resolve that prevent you from generating new value. So having those impediments and now understanding what the effort values are, we did these calculations and we modeled over time with these impediments increasing with our needs in there and we applied it with a standard amount of effort. We wanted our teams to be working efficiently, but not being burdened, not burning out. So we modeled that and we noticed something strange. The flow of value over time always went down. Even when we're just applying a consistent amount of energy, the flow of value goes down. So we flipped it. Right, well, what if we want to maintain the flow of value? Then we started to notice the cognitive load was just exponentially going up. Well, there was always going to be a point where you reach maximum cognitive load. And that for us was a key point because it's at that point that you can maintain an increase in energy to maintain your level of flow of value. But at the, the point where you reach potentially reach burnout, you can't apply any more energy. So the flow of value starts to deteriorate. The length of time it takes to reach that point is something we call the resilience of the team. And that decrease in the flow of value, we go back to the laws of physics, laws of thermodynamics, it's flow entropy. Over time, flow will naturally decay. All systems decay. Um, what, what, what was oh, Software is like uh, like wine or cheese or something like yeah. that. Yeah, milk, not wine. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's like, it's, like, it's like milk, not fine wine. It is going to go off. It's going to decay over time. And so is the flow of value over time. Yeah. So doing that modeling, that's where we came up with the concept of flow entropy and also understanding what the resilience of your team is. In other words, how long your team can go working as they are 
before either their cognitive load gets too high and you start to get people in danger of being burnt out or the flow of value gets decreased to such a point that your team is no longer efficient and effective. And what you need to do at that point? Well, that's the point where you need to deal with your technical debt, with the outstanding production issues, with all of those problems, the things that are holding up that team and causing the problems for them. Which means now, instead of an arbitrary, let's do a technical debt cleanup session once every two weeks, you now know exactly how long your team can go before they need to go into that kind of work. And the, re and the really interesting thing about our, our hypothesis, and it is a hypothesis, right? So we'd love people to come and practice some of the things that, we, that we've kind of put together here to, to help validate our hypothesis. But the really interesting thing is, is that that flow entropy and the resilience that team ha teams have has nothing to do with how good those individuals are in the teams. It has nothing to do with how much testing they're doing. It has nothing to do with, with anything that you can think of except the organization of the team, how the team is wired, Wire, wiring the winning team. You know, another another great book from IT, right, that Gene Kim's just put out, Wiring the Winning Organization, right? It's all about how the teams are connected and all about the interactions that happen that really tells you a lot about whether they're going to be successful or not. Absolutely. We've got about five minutes, just a little bit more uh, than that left. So I think probably it's time to talk about what's next, really. So um, we've obviously done this launch today. So we're going to make lots of noise about that over the coming days and make sure that um, everyone knows that it's there. A lot of people have downloaded it. I've just had a look at the list already. So thank you to the audience today and thank you for downloading it. Um, Craig, what should they do if they've got a question or they want to tell you about something they've experienced? Well, um, what, we're, what we're also announcing today is the creation of a, a new community, community of practice, um, where we're hoping people can come and ask us questions and try out some of these things um, for themselves. And actually, we have a, we have a, a website, a sister website to um, the VSMC website. So the new community of practice is a proud community of the Valley Stream Management Consortium. But folks can go to vsra-community.org. Uh, where they'll find lots of information about, about the new community and what we're, we're trying to do to help folks to, uh, to really start to, to practice doing VSRA. Fabulous. And I'll add that to the page as well, but I've added a link to the chat for today, so we'll uh, get everyone pointed at that as well. So, uh, so Craig, do we want to mention our other little treat that we've got to <laughs> get sure. on that community page? I, sure. I, I teased that there was going to be. A <laughs> we could sure. show people the page if you wanted. You could. I could share my screen for a minute, and we can. Um, yeah, let me just see. I'll just uh, share this up, bring this up for people to see. So here is uh, the VSRA community page, and from there you can join the VSMC. We have the links through to the VSMC. More about the community. Learn what is VSRA. You can, this will take you to the link for downloading the actual uh, white paper, but you'll see a couple of nice little buttons here. Here is a how-to guide on how to use the VSRA practically. Um, it's a simple 12-step guide. There's a PDF document which you can download, which shows you how to actually use the principles of the value stream reference architecture within your organization, and then to apply it into an app. The app is also available uh, on a link from there, and here it is. And from here, you are able to see all of your various uh, team, uh, you're able to enter your organization information as per this, uh, this, this, this guide that you've got on here, which will take you through all of the steps. And from that, produce a PDF report, which will provide you with all of the information about the flow of value in your teams, what your team topology types are, the impediments, the resilience of your team, and provide you with various information. And we would love people to get onto this, try it out, model it, give us feedback. Let us know your stories. Tell us your exciting things, the things that you're finding. And the beauty of it is you can do this and not be impacting anybody in your organization. This is for fun. You can do this for fun. And maybe out of doing this for fun, you can actually find a way that you can go into your organization and say, we've potentially got a more efficient way that we, that we could run here. 
And that's what it's really about, isn't it? It's about being more efficient and more effective as well. So I think um, we haven't really talked about this today, but the duality that I talk about, about value stream management, that we talk about flow and getting faster flow, but we also want to get uh, the right things out more often that our customers really want. So is there anything that you're doing currently in the reference architecture about value realization, or is that perhaps something that's coming next? Great. I, I, there, there is there is still a lot of other stuff but that we're looking. This at. is a, I, I got to say, this is an active area of research. Or it's, as Stephen said, we we started meeting monthly, um, and then we were meeting bi-weekly. Now we meet meet weekly, and every week we meet, we find some new thing that we could that we could kind of look at and and we really want people to join this community because we're only two people so, so the more people that join uh the more people that get involved um the more people we can we can ha help move that research forward um because i think there's a lot there's a lot more we can do there's a lot more that we where we can um kind of take this uh, and really create create a create that enablement i mentioned earlier that allows organizations and teams to to really find their north star in terms of what value really is and how they should organize, organize their teams around that and then lead into uh, lead into to value streams. I will, I will go back very quickly and so you mentioned this book as well uh, earlier Helen flow engineering right by our friend Steve um, the the chapter seven in here about dependencies that was the thing got me really excited in here and that's how this kind of really ties into VSRA and we're, we're talking to Steve about some things about how we can collaborate as well um, with him on some of these things so I'm really excited to see what comes out of that but but we'd love others, others to get involved as well come join us come come try out come try out the tool try out what we've done and tell us if it works and, and we want to hear the good and the bad right if you if you think that it's not working and you think that there's some aspect of it that just doesn't make sense let's let's talk about that yeah, uh, I, mean, I was going to mention the work that we're doing with Steve. We're, we're, we're looking at how, you know, the, this as we've moved from scientific theory into practical application, it's how now we can start to plug VSRA into practical applications as part of flow engineering, plugging those two things together. Um, also, um, I, I, we've been having discussions with Manuel and with Matthew as well. There's a few ideas that we've been banding around there, nothing firm or concrete uh, at this point in time, but there's a few things that we've been thinking about there. Um, and then there's just general suggestions, like, for example, that we've been having on here today, you know, considering team dynamic, you know, dynamic teaming and how that plugs into it. Layman's Law, I think I've seen somebody. Uh, mention on here as well so these are all things that we want to, uh, to to have a look at i'm seeing some chatter of something about um yeah it's okay we can take that offline i can see what the problem is in fact if you two wanted to stay on or we'll jump on slack i'll show you what's happening and we yep. can figure it out but this has been marvelous thank you so much both of you for sharing so much of your journey with us and all of this incredible thinking that's going on um, I think it reflects how much value stream management is becoming a reality. If you look at the people that are on this call and the people that are in our membership and all the people that are coming to the VSMC website on a daily basis, more and more people are adopting value stream management. So um, as a community, it isn't just the two of you. I'm here, it's three of us. No, just kidding. It isn't just the three of us. There are hundreds, there are thousands actually of us now connected to the VSMC. So we need to get really good at sharing this best practice or good practice I prefer um, and getting it out there so everyone can benefit so thank you to you two for sharing so much of what you're learning and um, yeah I'll see everyone somewhere sometime soon but it's been great to spend some time with you today thanks guys thank thanks. you no worries loved it thanks guys see you soon bye